Yeah, greetings, people. Doc Martin, criminologist, educator, social commentator, and creative arts practitioner here. Welcome to the Roadman's Guide, a podcast chat show about life and issues from the ends, aka the inner city, the road, or just the streets. And you know something? Despite the bad press, negative labeling, distorted myths, and inaccurate portrayals, people in the end survive, live normal lives, and contribute to the betterment of our community. This is down to positive, strong-willed and self-determined individuals, groups and organisations who work tirelessly to make the community a better place where there's hope, optimism and more importantly, a sense of belonging. The Roadman's Guide is about giving a platform to those individuals who can voice the concerns, give us insights, pass on the wisdom and offer solutions to the complex nature of life in the ends. But more importantly, the Roadman's Guide is about the community for the community. So get involved, come onto the show and talk, become a listener, as well as giving us some feedback to shape, guide and improve what we do. Yeah, greetings, people. Um, Doc Martin here again. Um, have you ever noticed when you're walking around the inner city, uh, you you look around at some of it, some of it looks mashed up, some of it looks a little bit better, and you sometimes think to yourself, how can that be? In the same neighbourhood, we've got the haves and the have-nots. So today's show, we're going to be looking at all things community, and it gives me uh, great pleasure that we've got in a in a studio, We've got our guest, Chahail, who's gonna uh spit some bars. <laughs> um did I say your name right? Yeah, Shale. So, yeah. Is it Shale? Shale, yeah. Oh okay, because names are important because uh-huh. I've noticed certain guests that if you get the name wrong, they kinda of wanna leap over and just tump you up. And if you notice, <laughs> you can't see me, but I'm not really that big. <laughs> and when you're a lot like bigger than somebody like me. <laughs> so uh, so Shale, Shahail. Shale. Yeah, so no, but what do your family call it? How do they? They call me Shale. Okay. So has it got a meaning? You know, funny story, man. They spelled it wrong. It what do you mean they yeah? spelled, spelled it wrong? You know, it's, it's a weird story. It doesn't make no sense at all. It was My name was something totally different when my given name. But they had spelled it wrong. So that young, in, in talking in the 80s, they didn't have advocates. Parents weren't really good at reading and writing English. And they missed the last H from my name. So it's spelled S H A L E. H. So in school, they dropped the last H. So it was meant to be Sale. Yeah, but it stuck with Shale. And it's, it just makes no sense. Well, you know something? I'm glad you started that because, be, you know, before we get into any of these issues yet, um, for people listening, tell us a little bit about who you are. Talk, talk a bit about growing up. So, yeah, um, I've, I've, we've um, four generations in, in Los Al's. So my grandfather, you know, came in as a ship merchant. My father came when he was about 12 years old from Bangladesh. Um, I, I was born in Lazales. I still live in the same house I was born in. So we came through, you know, we, we were a close-knit family. There was uh, four brothers, four sisters. We lived in a two-bedroom house. Um, we, like a typical Asian family, we brought the house next door. Um, well, you, you know what's interesting when people say typical Asian family? Because, you know, I'm, si- I'm nearly 60, and I remember the first time I encountered people from Bangladesh. Yeah. And my knowledge in the early years that people from Bangladesh had a very tough time. So when we say typical, would you honestly say that the experience of your four generations coming in was typical? No, typical in terms of we were large families, you know, that people kind of identify. But the royal family is large. Yeah. But, you know, generally people still say that a big, a typical Asian family is a family that lives in a small house. There's a, f- a fair few of them. So, so, so y- how many brothers and sisters you got? So, um, there's there's eight of us, four brothers, four sisters. Where where do you fit in that? I'm, I'm number three. In the- three. So, just describe growing up. Did you get... It's crazy, man. It's crazy. Like, you could imagine we were eating toes and feet for breakfast and we were waking up. We were all, all cramped in one bedroom. But, you know, I would not change anything. You know, we had two rooms. One room, there was all us brothers. And we had this little box room. We made it into a room. My sister stayed there because she was one year younger than me. And then my mom and dad lived in a room with four of the little siblings. But, um, yeah, and for the for my teenage years, downstairs living room was my bedroom. You know, but people always ask, you know, 
I, I, I wouldn't change a single thing. Why, why is family important to you? Um, I, I think it, it, this thing about relationship, this thing about comfort, this thing about everybody kind of giving each other a tap on the back, and it's just this bond and relate. You know, you go through these challenges and obstacles together, and you come through it. But it, it's not an obstacle or a challenge when you're young. You know, so this thing about overcrowdedness is massive now. Oh, we in overcrowded houses, but when you're living in it at that age, it was never an issue or a problem for us. We never thought I need my own room. You know, it's just part and parcel of growing up. Well, that, that kind of leads on um neatly then because obviously when you get lots of families it makes the community yeah so describe the when you was growing up the early years of being a bangladeshi family in amongst working class white families in amongst african caribbean families describe a little bit about how you started to experience community when you was growing up i think my earliest memory would probably be things burning during the 85 riots. And I could remember that, you know, just I could remember a car flipped over. Um, and I can remember growing up, you know, we couldn't come past. Um, uh, there's Villa Cross. Uh, uh, that was our barrier. Uh, and then you came to past where Sakib's is now. They had two pubs on the corner. That was a barrier because people wouldn't walk past it because people would congregate in pubs and they'll take up the whole space on the roads and this and that. And I can remember growing up, you know, about eight, nine-year-old, and that was our boundaries that we were restricted to. And I can remember my my road was full of working-class uh, white families. And then oh, I could just remember slowly, slowly, they all just moved. And I still don't know why, you know. Um, that, that could just remember one by one, all the families just moved slowly. So my house next door to me that uh, we brought eventually was empty. Growing up about 15 years, we lived next to a petrol station that was derelict. There was nothing there. And how did how did that impact? I mean, in terms of your formative years, yeah, was that your introduction to like segregation? Well, I mean, what was that an introduction to? I don't. When I, when I look back at it, and even at that time, living in that moment, it was a bit of a. It was a really nasty place, you know, in terms of how you viewed it. You know, the the area looked. So if if you looked, at, I came out of my house, and there was a telephone box, and there was always needles and this and that outside. And there was always a fag button and there was a derelict, um, big, massive petrol station, which was empty for years. The next door neighbor's house, it was empty. So there was nothing around us. And I can remember growing up just hanging on that street corner, Carpenter's Road. And that was it. That that was life for us, you know. But did you did you ever at any stage want to get out of that? I mean, did because you were saying you've got this tight knit family. But yeah. did did the kind of strength of the family make you just see what was outside? That's just the way it is. I mean, was there never a moment when you thought, oh, I just want to leave? Yeah, that's weird. You know, like, I, I would think that now that, you know, at that age, growing up in that kind of neighbourhood, I would think that I'd want to leave. But I never, ever thought that, you know, and I can't put a reason why. But it was just probably because we had everyone around us. So we had the friends. So we had a routine. We would go to school, come back from school, go to mosque, finish mosque at six, half six, come out, chill with the lads, the friends for a bit. And that was it. That was life for us. So, so in a way, you had a, a routine. Yeah, that's it. You know, it was regimental. Um. What point did you start to get an awareness about the way that you engaged in the community? Because obviously you were growing up, you yeah. had an extended family. Where did you start to look at the community in terms of how you engage with it? So it was one of these things that, you know, when you're young, I always thought that there's the thing about you wanted to be known. So in school, if you were a class clan, you were the, you were the geezer or whatever it was, you wanted to be known. So... And I always thought that, you know, when, you, when I used to hang around in that street corner and people were walking and driving past and some of the people were really, really well known and people would stop and beep and this and that. And I thought, yo, I want some of that, you know, I want to be known. Um, but there was two ways. I always thought there was two ways. There was a the bad way where people will respect you because you're a drug dealer, you're this, you're that. Or there was actually the other way where you can just do good things. Well, let, let, me, let me just stop you there, though. Um, why didn't you go the bad way? Or did you, did you dabble? Did you ever... No, because, you know, um, my brother went to prison when we were really young. And I can remember when he went to prison, this is the first time ever I realised that he took the whole family with him because they had stuck him somewhere, a four or five-hour journey in the middle of Weymouth in Portland somewhere. And every Sunday we would go a four-hour drive. And I'd realised that we were in with him because my mom and dad, and I would see how they would react. And he was, it was this thing about Asian families and people thought, OK. And at that time... It was he was one of the first Asian lads to go into prison, and it was a stigma kind of thing like, ah, oh, look at these lot, look at that. 
all that kind of thing. And I thought, oh my God. And it was quite embarrassing because I can remember the house uh, uh, being raided um, and everybody was around and talking about it. And I thought, you know what? This is not the life. Well, we'll talk a little bit about the the transition that you made when you started to actually do stuff in the community. Talk a bit about the early days of that transition. Yeah, so, you know, after leaving school, I, I went to, my parents sent me to Bangladesh to a boarding school for about two years. And I studied. What was that like? Awesome. That was probably the best moment of my life because I had studied in, it was like an orphanage. So the students that were with me, they had no homes, they had no parents. They, one guy who was next to me and um, he, he had no sight, he was born without sight. But for them, they had enjoyed life. They were always there with a smile on their face. And that stuck with me forever, man. And I thought, wow, you know, they've really and truly in terms of things, they've got nothing. But, you know, they're living. So would you say that going to Bangladesh kind of changed your values? A hundred percent, because my grandfather, I lived with my grandfather. He used to be an old school, educated Bangladeshi man. So um, he was a deeds writer, you know, land registry and all of that. So he was educated. So he used to chuck me in the newspaper and say, um, this is how you're going to learn, read the newspaper and you learn how to read and write Bengali. You know, um, we had never studied uh, to learn, and read and write Bengali. And he gave me these lessons and he he would do these characteristics. And he was really well known, really well liked. Everybody liked him. I thought, I want to be like this guy. So he was my role model growing up. I said, um, this is the guy I want to be like, man. When you, when you came back to England after coming from Bangladesh, yeah. did you, because um, you know, a lot of us, I mean, part of my background is from the Caribbean. It took me yeah. ages to learn to speak like my father. When you came back from Bangladesh, did you, did you kind of upset people by speaking in a ways that they couldn't speak or understand? No, it was it was funny. People loved it because cause they couldn't speak the language. And there was a guy who all of a sudden was really fluent in the language and really sharp with the language. And they loved it. So I would go places. Ah, oh, you say some things in Bengali, you know. And the, it, w- it was one of them kind the of... People actually for swear words in Bengali. Oh, yeah. yeah. No swear words. Everybody generally <laughs> knows anyway. <laughs> but it was one of them things that because I was quite sharp with it, that people really, really um, took to it. and They appreciated it. That, wow, this is a kid that actually knows how to speak the language. Growing up, when you started to get involved in the community, because the thing I'm interested in, you know, your family sounds like a Bangladeshi version of the Waltons, <laughs> right? which is a nice, wholesome, yeah. which is great. Yeah, right. During any of that time, did you ever experience racism, bullying based on your difference at that time? I think we were fortunate because um, at the time in the late 80s, so you had... The, the crossover of Los Alza Newtown, which was the kind of the National Front were based there. So my brothers and all that, who was older than me, he used to tell me the stories about uh, um, what they had been through. But I can remember, because there was patches of these white families that lived on our road, I can remember going to the park of school and they would have a dog called Rambo. And every time they seen us, um, Rambo kill. That's what I can remember, one of my fun memories of kind of growing up. And they would just set the dog on us all the time. So, you know, when you look back at it and I thought, um, at the time, we didn't know why, but we were targeted, obviously, because of the, of the color of our skin. Well, uh, just just a, a fact. Yeah. Uh, in the southern states of America, Mississippi, Atlanta, Georgia, yeah. um, during the civil rights movement, dogs were specifically trained to bite and kill black people. I mean, but dogs have always been used to hunt prisoners down and stuff. So it, it's a kind of tradition yeah. that dogs have been used to hunt, not just rabbits and here's people. So. That tradition has been unbroken. For, so it's yeah. not just, or it happened to you, yeah, but I'm man. just going to say that it happened yeah, for many, many time, years. Yeah. Um, connecting to the community and you started, I mean, what was your, did, did you set up a business? No, I think my, when, when I, my connection to the community was uh, when I came back from Bangladesh and I was about 17, nearly 18, and all my friends at that time had, they, they had started to smoke weed and this and that. And, you know, they were going through the, the formative years as a teenager. And I was thinking, yo, I missed out, man, because I had been away for 16 to 18, them two years, and they had been to college, made new friends. And I thought, yo, I had missed out. So from about 17 to about 21, I was doing nothing. I was uh, working at this job for a few months and that job for a few months. I didn't really have a purpose um, until it was about 22 when I had fallen to the job by accident, really. So it wasn't something that I wanted to be a youth worker or this and that. But I wanted to pay the bills because we were struggling as a family. There was a lot of us, you know, and I wanted to work because we come from a family of values of work because my brothers started work when they were 13, 14. They were starting part-time work in restaurants because that's our trade. The catering trade is, our, is the Bangladeshi trade. So even if you speak to 13, 14-year-olds now, um, some of them are still uh, working part-time in a restaurant. 
they had done it, but I hadn't done it. So I'd wanted to work from an early age. Um, 